Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is Angela Tilby. Now, Reverend Angela is a, a ca canon emeritus at Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford, and also, I believe, a, can of on a canon of honour at Portsmouth C Cathedral. Angela is also uh, a regular contributor to Radio 4's Thought for the Day and is a, a regular columnist for the Church Times. Angela, welcome to the Godcast. How are you? Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Good to be here. Whereabouts are you, Angela? Where, where's home for you? I live in Portsmouth now and in retirement. I was in Oxford before that and Cambridge before that and St Albans before that and briefly Manchester before that. So I've been all, all over the shop really. Um, but it's lovely to be in a coastal city um, with the sea just 50 yards away. And that's, um, that's really worked very well. And the cathedral is literally just over the road. So it's, um, it's you know, there's a, there's a place to go and to worship and be part of. Yeah. And living so close, Angela, does that mean you're called on regularly to help out or, or participate? Or do you do that by choice? Um, the cathedral's fairly well staffed. That's not, I, I don't think I'm, uh, I'm particularly needed, but uh, it's, it's a delight to contribute from time to time. And I do do odd things in the diocese too. There are some parishes I help help out with from time to time when needed. <clears throat> and and we touched on the, the writing for Church Times, Angela. I, mm. I, I would imagine you that's a huge enjoyment and privilege for you to do. Do you still enjoy that aspect of your life? Yes, I do mostly. I mean, it's a very different thing from, you know, I was in broadcasting for many years and I, I sort of, the, the broadcast world is one I'm very familiar with. And um, I, I, I was a producer long before I was a p performer on radio. And um, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of the constraints of the broadcast world, you know, that you are always talking to people who have a huge range, not just to believers or certainly not just to Anglicans. With the Church Times, the journalism is, it's a much more narrow focus. And that's both an advantage in some ways, because it means you can drill down into the nitty gritty of things which are affecting um, people quite, quite intimately. Um, sometimes I think you have to remember that, um, that it is quite a small audience, you know, that the Church of England is getting smaller and the kind of people who are sufficiently in to read a church newspaper are even fewer, really. So you are in a very, very specialised audience, which you have to take take account of. Yes, I, I, I suspect knowing the church as I do, it's it's not a place uh, without debate. So you, you must get some uh, interesting responses to your articles. Yes, I've only once, I think, had that um, thing of wanting you to say, nobody loves to, everyone hates me, I'm going down the garden to eat worms. But I, I did once, at the, uh, I'd, I'd written something about the Thy Kingdom Come initiative. Um, and I know I was in a flaming bad mood about it because of uh, ha having a, a study day, which I'd been involved in, hijacked by Thy Kingdom Come in a way that had really <laughs> made me cross. And um, so I wrote this rather critical piece about, about um, it and various things associated with it. And it was the first time I'd really experienced a sort of Twitter pylon, you know, in which clearly a group of rather cross people contacted each other and, you know, started it was awful thing to kind of have on Twitter started started a movement. So every every time I went on Twitter, there was a hundred more sort of condemnations, and um, it was quite a lesson really because I, I first of all realised that I think I had gone further than I needed to. That it was perhaps don't be um, driven by your passions, which is something that I. I ought to know because one of my interests is the history of the early church and I've written a book about Evagrius, the great um, sort of uh, early church ascetic who really defined what a deadly sin was in terms of an outrageous passion. So I did know, I did know a bit about not going over the top. Um, but I think it was also slightly depressing to see the way that um, this culture of, of pylon and of cancelling voices that you find difficult how that's that could take root in the church as, as way, yeah. in ways that it does in other parts of, of society and I think that's a shame because I do think you need honest debate and I think you need you sometimes need satire and you sometimes need unfairness um, to uh, you know for people to actually understand what it is that's being debated and yeah. I think sometimes we're a little bit um, 
you know, our, our Anglican forebears were much ruder than we are inclined to be. It's it's and very it's, a bad thing. No, it's it's very interesting you saying that, Angela. I'm I'm recently appointed to General Synod, and I'm uh, going through the tea, uh, probably best described as teething troubles of finding oh, yeah. my way in. But I was most disturbed to to learn that the chaplain Andrew Hammond had. Uh, has resigned today from, oh, from really? his role yes. as, as chaplain. What do you what do you think something when something like that happened says to the outside world about the Church of England? You know, when, when a chaplain is 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 standing down because of difference, really. Yes, um, I mean, I think that I don't know the circumstances in which he resigned or what that issue was about. Um, but I do think that the Synod is a fairly abrasive, can be a fairly abrasive atmosphere. Um, and perhaps this, you know, perhaps that's how it has to be. It models itself on parliamentary democracy. And although in a way it doesn't have the same reach and it doesn't work quite in parties, not in political parties in the way that Parliament does, I think some of its manners are very similar. Um, for, for good and bad, I mean, ages and ages ago, I remember uh, when I was with the BBC attending for the, the great debate that the Synod had on, on the bomb. Um, this was in the 1990s, I think, or even earlier. And it was an extraordinarily sort of civilised but um, forceful debate on both sides. I mean, it was very strong arguments put with enormous passion, um, very well done. And it was it was kind of and you, you, you began to see what a debating chamber where people were very strongly opposed and had very, very different views could actually be in terms of clarity and of engagement. You know, there's, there, we shouldn't be afraid of that, I don't think. But when it descends into the kind of, um, you know, the worst of party politics, then I think it is a bit, it's just a bit dispiriting, really. I mean, I don't think we can, you know, there's this wonderful myth that in the early church, I think there's some truth, <laughs> possible truth in it, that when something difficult was going to be debated, you know, everybody had to sit there and not go into the loo until they reached unanimity. Um, and you can imagine what that was like, what pressure that put on people to come to an agreement. Um, I think it's a, it's a myth. Um, but you don't suppress dissent by refusing to let it be spoken. Um, I think that what we all need to attend to more is the, the quality of our elections, you know, how people get elected yeah. to what is like the General Synod. And in a way to ensure that there are, the range of voices doesn't exclude the naturally hesitant or those whose relationship with the church is less than uh, full on, um, because I think one of the weaknesses of the Church of England at the moment is that it, it, is a it is becoming a church of zealots and enthusiasts rather than representative of a wider constituency. We're not quite the national church in the way that we, we um, were once, but I still think there's a penumbra of people who may attend relatively rarely, but still feel they have some, some say and want to have some say. And I think they should be represented both at parish church council level and at general synod level. Yes, and 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 meanwhile, uh, Angela, you know the, the world carries on around us, doesn't it? Um, around synod, and you know, yeah. I was reminded by the, uh, I think it was the Archbishop of Canterbury's opening address that you know that we're we're almost down to one percent of people who attend church on a, a weekly basis. How do you think we are perceived in the nation at this moment in time? Are, are we are we still kind of shackled by our history of, of, of recent years, or or do you think we are in a place where we can progress, or or is it too late? Well, it depends where you're looking from, doesn't it? Because depending where you sit, it depends what you see. And unfortunately, I think the church sits where the um, mass media and national papers sit to a large extent, which means that they're always looking at things from the top down. If you're looking at things from the ground up, it's rather different because the actual physical presence of a church building, um, whether or not it's properly staffed with, with, with clergy and with lay volunteers, um, 
it does make a huge difference. And I think that the, the, the great weakness of Synod is, and particularly since the church has sort of centralized itself on London and has introduced things like the Archbishop's Council, all of which have centralizing force, is that it's, it's seen itself more and more as something which is kind of organized by bureaucrats from behind office doors and computers, and much less as something which is spread on the ground like pubs and corner shops and, and you know, and, and actually makes a difference to real people in real places. So all of the, the current church's polity is about um, top-down organization, the suppression of the local, the gathering up of resources into greater and greater and further and further away bureaucracies. And um, it, 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 it's doing this in the name of, of, of mission, supposedly. But um, I think, I, I've got great doubts about this agenda, actually. I don't think the Church of England has ever really been a missionary church as such. It's had various attempts to, to be so. Um, but, but usually from the 16th century onwards, it's done everything it can to suppress that instinct and to cultivate in people a, a more um, neighbourly, um, devout, you know, caring for the neighbour, caring for the lo locality um, way of being Christian and, and left the mission stuff to other people who on the whole do it better and, and then provide the Church of England with another generation of disillusioned mission-centred folk, um, which we've been running off for a very long time. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not in sympathy with the, 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 the Church's current emphasis on, on mission. I think it's got it, to, it wrong, really. Um, and, and shouldn't be thinking along those terms. It should be thinking about service, service and pastoral care and how it can um, provide hope, charity, life to communities as they are, rather than trying to make them all disciples of Jesus, which has yeah. never been the way the Church of England has seen things as, as I see it. I think, I think that's so revealing, Angela, because it sits how I feel. You know, I mean, I'm on, I've done three synods now and... Uh, I don't think we have really talked about serving um, at all in, in in any great context or any great detail. But but what, of course, is coming, the great avalanche waiting at the top of the mountain to descend is the issue of living in love and faith. And, uh, you know, oh, yes. it's, it's almost like the, 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 the battle lines are drawn and um, let's get on with it. But but do you, do you have any hope, good hope for... Uh, living in love and faith as, as, a, as a, um, a project? Uh, no, not, I mean, not really. I've, I've not been involved in it. Um, I, I, I feel in, in a way that um, I can see why the church ended up having or thinking it's got to do this. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure that its interventions on issues of personal sexuality have been helpful to anybody very much, really. Um, I, I Just mean, expand on that, Angela, please. Well, well, what I mean is, I mean, there has been a change in attitude in society um, from one which I suppose is true when I was, you know, in my childhood and teens, which is when homosexuality was rarely mentioned. And if so, it was something slightly dubious or scandalous. But even then, you know, we're talking about the late 50s, early 60s. There were an enormous number of people who were sympathetic to persons of homosexual orientation. And I think the church should have really just evolved along with that um, uncontroversially. Um, I mean, personally, I, I regret the, um, the uh, uh, personally, I think the civil partnerships um, ideal was, was a really good one, which enabled, in a sense, these, this, the special status of marriage to be retained while equal legal and civic rights were given to gay couples. I think that that worked brilliantly. But then, of course, he heterosexual people wanted to be civil partners too. So the whole thing gets then lost in something where you can neither have um, true inclusion nor true diversity because the two always fight against each other and it seems to me now got into this ridiculous situation about sexuality where um ev everything is subjective what i declare myself to be is what i am and that carries 
huge sort of status and credibility, quite apart from what anybody else might make of me. I mean, my sense is that in Anglicanism, we are, we are brought towards God through relationships with other people, through their recognition of us and our recognition of them, through our taking on of roles and responsibilities within a wider society, which form us and heal us and bring us into the salvation that God has, has promised for us. And that's, that's a benign view of relationship and of society in all its richness and fullness. And we've swapped that, it seems to me, for a sort of, you know, hybrid individualism where I am what I am and you must take me as I am no matter what, where I have no roles or responsibilities other than what I choose to fulfill myself. And I think this is very impoverishing actually. I think it's impoverishing the church because its spirituality becomes me-centered. My experience of Jesus, my experience of the Holy Spirit, my call to discipleship, my vocation, my ministry. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's, it's very it, 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 it doesn't allow, in a way, for the fact that I am shaped by the people around me and I, I am I'm sort of, in a way, given birth by, by others, um, which I think is a much more Christian and holistic model of society. I was just listening to a rather wonderful lecture by um, uh, Alison Milburn um, yesterday about Jane Austen, Jane Austen's novels, and how um, her Anglicanism was very gently poised. You know, she wrote some prayers very much based on the Book of Common Prayer model. Shows how in, in her novels, um, the characters who are really nasty pieces of work usually end up at the end, much as they were at the beginning. They're unchanged. They stay who they are. But most of the characters who have a sort of a good or reasonable outcome to their lives are changed by relationship. They're formed, they're sort of slightly battered about, but they're also redeemed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think she's got that right. It oh. is in, in our relationships that we're, we're saved and, and made. And, and with those relationships, um... Angela, you know, I was chatting with some uh, conservative evangelical um, peers at Synod and, and asking if there was a, a way forward. And it was pretty much no, there, there is no. Yeah, no they're very wiggle. much on this, aren't they? I, I don't quite know why it is so. I mean, you know, there have been love between women and women and men and men since time immemorial, as far as I can work out. We haven't always called them gay. We haven't always called them <laughs> transitioners or whatever. But we've we've accepted that there is um, there is a huge range in the way in which men and women express themselves. And... Um, I think we, you know, I think in many societies, even if it's not been condoned in quite the way that we would, it's been a sort of acceptance <coughs> that there is this human variety and something which can be rejoiced in. Um, and, you know, 16th century, full of, full of men falling in love with men, you know, it was, it was, it's, it's not as if it's something new. And somehow we, we are treating this as if it's something that we've kind of never heard of before, as mm. if the whole human race is being upset by it. And I don't understand the, the wildly conservative evangelicals with their obsession with celibacy as the only option. I just, I just, why? You know, it's just not as serious as that. Um, and it's important who you have sex, but it's not the end of, it's not a matter of heaven and hell, is it? Well, not for me, it isn't, but, but, for, but for others, it clearly is. It's yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's, it's, it's sad in a way because it, it just makes for a lot of very unhappy people and people who, who want to keep their Christian faith, but feel that, you know, if they stir from the line that's been given to them, that they're, they're, they're going to hell. I mean, I, even as someone who was born in 1950, I find it, I find it really offensive to think that that could be taught seriously. I mean, it wasn't in my youth, you know, if you, if you went to a priest and thought you might be gay, you wouldn't be told, you wouldn't be talked to in that kind of way. No. You might be told, well, look, it would be better if you were to marry, try and see if you can find a nice girl, you, can, you know, I mean, that would be, but it was relatively benign, but mm. this kind of extraordinary puritanism, um, which I don't think is worked out, it, it, there's no parallel in heterosexual relationships, 
I mean, evangelical heterosexual relationships are not policed in quite that kind of way, as far as I'm aware. I mean, perhaps yeah. they are. But, 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 but I, I, I don't see a good outcome in the sense that, um, of course, the church will have to decide to do something. I think the only thing it can really decide to do is what it did over the remarriage of divorced people years and years ago, which was that it, it, it basically said it was up to the parish priest. Yeah. And they must discern, given the tools of discernment that they've been given through their ordination and through their pastoral practice, whether or not it's right for them to marry this particular couple. Yes. But there are problems about it. I mean, I've, I've hinted at these in an article I wrote for the Church Times about the, the real difficulties of writing a service. Um, if you look at the preface to the marriage service, it does make certain assumptions about what is before you as a man and a woman. Um, now, do you rewrite that? <coughs> do you write a different preface, in which case you've got a, basically a different right, a different service? You know, how do you have equality and and diversity. You can't actually on this issue. And I think, I always think that the Church of England is how you express it liturgically is a very, very key question. And that's going to be a really difficult problem yeah. for those who are in favor of, of so called equal marriage. Angela, liturgically, it's a problem for us in the church. But meanwhile, uh, the millions of people outside of the church just go and get a civil partnership. You yeah. know, and, um, and, and, and and the other point of that is, is that uh, what, what concerns me is what you said before was really profound. You know, that the spirituality becomes about me, me, me. And and some of the really horrible kind of trolling that I've seen and witnessed towards somebody who holds a different view or, or happens to suggest something that might not agree with them. You know, I, I'm not a gay person, but if I was, I frankly would think... In God's name, why would I want to be uh, married within this this church? You know. Yes. No. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I must say I've been aware of um, being to some extent cancelled by friends on the other side because I don't hold sufficiently um, liberal views on this. Um, I'm not quite sure what my views are on it at the moment. I think that that actually gay marriage in the church of some kind or another is probably inevitable. I'm not entirely convinced that it's the best solution, but I'd go along with it. You know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't oppose it as such. I'm, I'm just not terribly convinced that the, 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 the reasoning and the pastoral case has been made well enough. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, I, 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 the persecution of gay people um, by the Pur Puritan charismatics is 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 horrendous, and you know that that's there's there's no way that that could, should be um, just allowed to continue. Yeah. The par paradox of it is, though, and this is where it gets so complicated, and it's like the issue about conversion therapy. I mean, there was a letter, wasn't the sent who sent it to whom now, or to the government, um, by 800 or so, <coughs> that's more, sorry, post-COVID cough, um, of leaders of churches um, saying that, you know, they, they, they didn't want um, the conversion therapy to be banned. And this was, you know, hugely sort of called out and attacked by, um, by people in the church. Um, of a more liberal view. When you actually looked at the list, which I did, and what I found really rather uh, touching, sad, made me think, was that although there were the usual suspects, you know, there were the usual evos who you knew would come out, with, a lot of these churches came from areas and represented um, pastorates that were minority, ethnic minority, poor areas, places of you know, where you Im imagined you know a small bible class based church in a rotten area fighting social and all sorts of deprivation and they were conservative about sexuality and they were being hammered by the big liberal middle classes with all their and I, I just began to feel a bit uncomfortable about the way that so many of those churches were they were more conservative than we middle class liberals feel comfortable with and what do we do about that? Mm. It's no good just hammering them, saying they're ignorant and stupid. No. Angela, this this uh, interview is whizzing by, and I've got lots of things I want to try and get <laughs> Sorry, in. But you, you touched there on about serving the uh, you know the people on the fringes, where uh, 
you know, people are in very difficult times and are heading for a very challenging autumn and winter. Do, do you think the church with um, with its all its resource and its history and, um, you know, its ability to affect change does enough in 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 places of urban deprivation or do you think they need to do more? I think it tries. I think it genuinely tries. Um, I, I, I have found, though, and this may be just a local experience, that the HTB church plant type of churches are very exclusively middle class and they seek a middle class youthful demographic. You know, their, their example of reaching out to the poor was to offer sort of pamper parcels at Christmas and, you know, um, free pizza on the street. But of course, if you were homeless, you didn't get it because um, <laughs> actually they were after, after teeny boppers. And, all. and I find that rather depressing because, mm. I mean, the one great thing about the, the, the Wesleys and the Wesleyan revival um, was it seemed to me they really did reach out to uh, the urban poor in a completely new way and brought education as well as companionship and belonging. And I don't see our mission-centered um, churches, I'm, I'm sure some of them do, but th that doesn't seem to be where the emphasis lies. The emphasis lies on converting individuals um, and then hoping that they'll do some good in the community. But I, I have to say my local experience of that has not been impressive. I felt that in a way they, the, the, the mission focused churches are really about middle class converts. Um, yeah. and, and, just, and, and, Angela, just for people who are watching this and not, are not familiar with HTB, this is uh, Holy Trinity Brompton. They're kind of a super church who kind of pop up across the country in, in places that are deprived and, and kind of a lot of money is poured in but but in my in some as a as a as a contrast to that somewhere like where we are in burnley the you know it's it's one vicar one curate and on you get you know so so there's the kind of difference there isn't there yes i think there's also something which makes it it very difficult and it's something to do with the confidence of the church in um in, in the way it recruits people for ordination, that there's there's a lot of emphasis on finding fulfillment as a, a person going into ordained ministry. What you don't find very much these days is that call to sacrifice, um, which used to be very much linked to the sense of vocation. Um, I mean, the thing I most regret is the decline of the re Anglican religious communities. You know, the fact that you, you, there was a point at which you could actually found a mission house in a deprived area and at least there'd be a group of people who would be there with a soup and a sandwich and a cup of tea. Um, you know, the first church which I was a vicar was had been run by the Franciscans in Cambridge and they had a long, long tradition of looking after pe homeless people. Um, and it, it wasn't just um, providing material things, though it was that, it was actually also providing that most needed thing of a listening ear and companionship and some sense that belonging mattered. Mm. Now, I think we've really lost that. And I'd love to see an initiative coming from the churches to draw, to draw younger people into a sacrificial life for the sake of God. You know, does nobody think that way anymore? Is it just intolerable or is it my ministry my vocation i'm going to run a super church you know <laughs> which is it seems to be where the appeal lies at the moment yes and it's been really lovely talking to you as, as a lady who uh, i say this with the greatest of respect is of a certain vintage um, <laughs> w where do you kind of place your priorities in your own ministry now well you know how do you how, how what forms and shapes your your life, um, uh, this um, period of, of living for you? It's a good question. I mean, I've, I've really let it evolve, I think, um, since I retired, which is about six years ago. Um, I mean, I love teaching and I'll, I'll, I'll teach anybody about the early church fathers or about the desert experience. Um, or sp spirituality is my kind of field, but mostly with a sort of early church bent. And I do quite a bit of that. Um, that and, and writing so I, I think I, I, I think I have a, a sense that I do what I sense God is calling me to and that means listening of course to what's going on inside your own mind and heart but also responding to what's out there and um, I've never had any real anxiety about where that leads I, 
I just follow it as far as I can. I mean, there are certainly things I'm, I'm not sorry to let go of, um, the committees and the paperwork and the things that took up an awful lot of time as a, you know, as a, as a parish priest and later as a, as a, as a canon in Oxford. Um, nobody minds letting go of paperwork and office work, do they? It's not, not difficult. But I, but I, I, I do feel a sort of responsibility to keep um, a sane version of the Christian faith um, being articulated. Um, and by sane, I mean one that's rooted in history, rooted in tradition, rooted in reality, rooted in scripture, um, and uh, neither fundamentalist nor wackily liberal, but somewhere in the middle, the great middle ground. Yes, and and just um, and and down in Portsmouth, how is how is the state of things? How is the diocese? How is uh, you know church numbers? Uh, what the, just I think sometimes we um, we dwell on the negatives, and I'd like to end yeah. this interview with things that you're inspired by at the moment down there. Well, we've got a new bishop, which has given a lot of of, of heart to people. I think. I mean, we like the old bishop too, but um, it's, it's it's always nice to inaugurate a new a new sense of, of of beginning. I mean, one of the things that has really heartened me, um, actually, this year I did two Christmas Eucharists in a church which had been told they weren't getting another vicar, weren't for a long time. Um, one was a very small church, it was full, a hundred people there, um, middle-aged elderly they were, but the second one I went to had 300 people and there were about 50 of them who were under 20 and they communicated. This was a village, you know, and I thought, well, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere really. And um, I mean, it, 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 it can be done, I, th I think it can be done, but it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm not sure that kind of, you know, costly involved local ministry is being encouraged much at the moment. I mean, it's partly the lack of balance between local and diocesan. And I, I, I was a diocesan bureaucrat for a time and I know how um, you, you just see things in a completely different way, which I increasingly came to think was a false and distorted way. Yeah. You know, I knew what parishes ought to do. Of course I did, because I was a diocesan bureaucrat who told them. <laughs> and, um, and of course, people will very easily walk into something which seems to offer answers and offer dependence. You know, yeah. you know what to do and then you do it. And there are a lot of clergy who feel insecure, who listen to the voice of somebody who tells them what to do, what they ought to be doing. Um, it's very seductive. Um, they forget that actually when they were ordained and given, given authority by the church, they were expected to be discerning people, prophetic people, people who knew their flock, not people who listened to the person on the third floor of diocesan office. So, yeah. <laughs> Angela, th thank you so much for your time. I I've thoroughly listened talking to you, uh, to listen to you impart some of your wisdom and uh, uh, you know, I'd love to talk to you perhaps again and keep in touch and uh, maybe do another one another time, because I think it's good to people here at uh, the voice of maturity and experience. And I think uh, you've clearly demonstrated in, in that, that in this podcast. So so thank you. Andrew. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much. Nice to have met you properly. <laughs>